Hello, everybody. Um, I would like um, you to welcome you to our panel, Learning from the Colonial Feminist Struggles on the Visibilization of Feminicide. Uh, thank you all for getting up so early, you being here in Germany at uh, 10 o'clock, and even more thanks to Tiago Galuan, who is now having his five o'clock in the morning because he is in Cordoba in Argentina. Um, and that's also one of our points, like he, him being in Cordoba in Argentina and Suhela in Pretoria, South Africa, and later probably in Turku, Finland. And um, like us being able to discuss um, the different activist and academic discourses and perspective on feminicide and femicide, talk about whether a global feminist struggle could be possible that is only possible due to the obligation we have uh, to have that conference in the dig digital space so different from what um, I heard yesterday from other panelists who said mm, oh no not another digital pan uh, panel I'm really I don't want any pandemic anymore I mean for sure we are not happy about the pandemic at all but we use that window of opportunity um, of the digital space uh, in order to have that marvelous panel because uh, we wouldn't have been able or have, having had the economic means to invite these three brilliant panelists although for sure we would like to or we have preferred to stay or to meet us in the physical airspace so um and before um we would like to start with uh, introducing aleda and tiago and suhela um, I'd like to give you a look behind the scenes as there is many, many persons um, involved in this panel. So point A, there is translation available um, into Spanish so and into English, but not into German. Um, sometimes that might be necessary for us to facilitate the understanding uh, among the panelists. Um, and also it allows us to mirror back the, this topic and this talk and discussion to the English and Spanish speaking communities. Um, so thank you to Anna and Carola who are doing us the, the great favor of translating. Um, they told us to please excuse them um, if in some moments they might be stumbling or struggling in order to get the ideas across. They are not immersed in, in these feminist uh, theoretical uh, discourses on gender feminicide and decolonial frameworks so um, it's an act of solidarity and thanks to both of you please excuse any stumbling um, so if you want as a, as a listener to have that translation please feel free to click on the uh, the globe icon that you um, find like down on your screen um, B, there is the moderation team for the chat. I think you can see them now. There is Stella and Jan, um, who will, yeah, hello, <laughs> who will, they are also part of the Archive of Feminist Geographies. They will moderate the chat and transfer your question from the listeners um, on to our panelists. So that the idea is that you could use the chat um, for communication, for free thoughts, um, but for questions um, to the panelists, we encourage you to use the um, Q and A section. And um, maybe if there are many, many questions like arousing, we won't be able to um, answer them all. So please excuse that. Um, and please also feel free to write your questions already in the Q and A section during the panelists' presentations, so instantly when they appear to you. And then um, there is Jana. She's another doing another until now invisible labor. Hello, Jana. <laughs> um, she's doing an autoethnographic mapping. And um, the idea behind is that we are a collective of feminist geographers. As such, we're trying to find alternative ways of um, presentations of cartographies of um, knowledge production um, ways that are not thought to, to conquer to define a two-dimensional territory but to map um, the intimate the emotional the bodily and our relations so what Jana does 
behind the scenes is now to yeah to guide it through an experimental approach to map reactions, impressions, associations that emerge during this panel, during the presentations and debates. So in a way that's a non-rational, non-theoretical um, experiment, a non-theoretical um, response from, from Frankfurt to um, the, the panelists' work. And yeah, we might have a look on it afterwards in order to explore these reciprocal resonances. Um, yeah, this panel um, emerged as part of our countermapping project against femicide, feminicide in Germany. I'm from AK Feminist Geographies. Um, we want to create alternative and subversive images and narratives uh, regarding the feminicidal violence in Germany with a geographical focus on Hessen, Frankfurt, where we live and work. Um, and love sometimes. <laughs> and this um, yeah, collective activist and academic project emerged ideally um, in Latin America, in Mexico in 2018, um, where the fight against feminicidio um, is one of the main and really powerful struggles where the different feminist movements um, have become really outreaching uh, mobilizing against the incredible lethal violence, which of course, of course, is like the peak of the iceberg of uh, gender-based violence. But um, yeah, that's feminicide, feminicidio, where women and queer or feminized bodies are murdered only because of their gender identities. This happens in a space of impunity, um, in spaces of discourses where uh, victimization of course where um, victims are ridiculized in spheres of society where gender-based violence is the norm that also refers to parts of leftist spaces and I was studying um, in Mexico in 2018 and um, being able to participate or to yeah be inspired by these struggles um, in the streets of Mexico I read an article in a German journal which said Quote, uh, each third day, um, a woman is killed in Germany by her partner or ex-partner, unquote. And I was in a way severely shocked. What, that occurs in Germany? Hmm, how can it be? And that was the first moment of stumbling because me, I think I'm a person that is post-colonial informed. I'm really critical about what's going on in German politics. I know a lot about confrontations with um, violent and sexist men. Um, in, in society in Germany and me I was astonished so that's already like one of the points of where this project is like uh, in between so coming back from Mexico all my uh, awesome compañeras from from the um, working group in Frankfurt also were enraged and astonished and we decided to yeah to start that project together um, working also with Keine Mehr and uh, Rio Brujas from Mexico. Um, yeah, and we felt in a way that we were surfing on that um, feminist tidal wave, La Marea Verde, um, the green wave that from Argentina, from uh, Latin America washed over to Europe. And we felt that we were kind of surfing, riding on it, what, what felt really, really great. Um, but um, yeah, I would like to tell you like lots about our great project and stuff, but um, today it's really important that um, we have been discussing a lot within the archive feminist geographies how we can connect to these feminist struggles um, instead of riding on the surfing on the wave, um, connect to their claims and gains that they have fought really hard for and, and where we are stuck now is um, how we can learn from different decolonial feminisms and integrate primary arguments and claims in our struggle here, but without annexing them. Actually, um, we see that decolonial is more and more becoming a buzzword um, used by Eurocentric groups and institutions also here in Germany. So it feels once more that the kind of occupation of discourse is going on, a depolitization, a whitewashing of putting it in, in gender mainstream discourses. So in this context, we would like to think of counter arguments against these tendencies. And there's, yeah, what that's what we would discuss with the three of you. Um, 
Um, and beg every one of you to give us a sh short input in order to figure out um, first different contexts and forms um, of the fight against femini femicide, feminicide, um, trans feminicide, and so on. Um, and um, maybe with a reference of what decolonial feminism means to you from your geographical epistemological situatedness. Um, and end with the short impulse whether, yeah, what kind of relations could emerge uh, for transnational feminism, feminist fight, or also critique on whether white feminism could be decolonial at all. So, yeah, so let's let me present you and thank you very much for coming, for joining us today. Um, Aleda um, Pinelo is a Mexican doctorate candidate at the Faculty of Law of the University of Torku. Um, she's working on an interdisciplinary research on feminicides and records in the European context with focus on Germany. She has been a contributor since 2011 to um, Feminicidio Net in Spain. She's also the co-founder of the project Feminicide Map in Mexico. And that's also where we got to know each other. Um, we read um, Aleda's um, semantic and political debate discussion um, in the academic uh, reel um, around femicide and feminicide. And so we finally um, this are using the Feminine sides and the neon brackets that's also reflected in the name of that panel. And uh, she will tell us more about these um, also fights around definitions. Um, Tiago Galuan uh, is an activist um, for the transgender community. Um, he woke up today really, really early in Argentina. Um, thank you. He works um, for the conquest of trans rights. Um, in educational institutions and political spaces against transphobia and violence. He's also part of the Students' Union of the uh, National University of Cordoba, which means that um, we speak also with the representative of the government of the National University of Cordoba. Welcome. Um, and he will explicitly uh, link decolonial, decoloniality and intersectional feminism and giving us the super possibility um, to explicitly also involve trans epistemologies within the feminist tidal wave. Um, and yeah, so th thanks for telling us like um, about the struggles and fights emerging in Argentina with the feminist Maria Verde. Um, and Suhela Suraj Pal, you're, she is a law, law clerk at the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Her dissertation um, discussed prison abolition um, as a decolonial and human rights imperative in Africa. And this focus on decolonial studies and the role of police and prisons has made her rethink her approach to feminism and femicide um, through an abolitional lens. So that's a topic that uh, she has written about in a number of occasions, is keen to discuss with us. And that's also where we where we met her, uh, reading her brilliant article, Why Carceral Feminism is Not the Answer, in our own search for our political claims in the fight against femicide here. So thank you very much also for that mind-blowing ideas. And I'm sure that there's more mind-blowing ideas emerging. Um, so yeah, we will have um, all three contributions now with some th uh, single questions of understanding concept and exploring them more profoundly before having a short break and then getting to the round table format. So yeah, Aleda, um, the screen is yours if you want to have it. So thank you very much. Everyone. And thank you for the introduction, Jodia, and also for the people on a Saturday morning that are joining us to discuss about this interesting subject, at least for me. And also just one note that the project Feminicide Map is in Germany, not in Mexico. <laughs> so yes. Um, well, I'm going to start sharing the screen soon, but I, I want to to tell you a little bit about the presentation. I, um, I've been asked that since not many of you are familiar with the subject of feminicide, I would uh, make a short 
uh, introduction to, to the subject and also to let you know what I am using this wording of feminicide um, within brackets and then going a little bit into the German context and some inputs on what can uh, feminism in the North do. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna start the presentation. How do you, okay. So you see the presentation, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just, can you yeah. put it on full screen? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Now, okay, well, as you can see here, I am using these brackets. Um, first of all, um, oh, no, I cannot move it. Ah. Yes, um, oops, no, oops, no, okay. So I'm gonna try to address these these questions here. Um, first of all, I would like you to think yourself um, and answer or to try to answer these questions to yourself. Like, what is a, a feminicide? Um, if, if this term was created in the global south, if it's a phenomenon that only occurs in the global south, and what do you think feminicide stands for? And if femicide and feminicide are the same. Uh, let's see if by the end of the presentation, you are still thinking the same. <laughs> um, so first of all, I want to uh, be clear that the concept of femicide was elaborated first by Diana Russell, because she uh, also complained that sometimes um, feminists are saying that it was a term created in the Americas, which is not totally true. And then also some people think that uh, feminicide was created in, in the Americas. So it's kind of a, a weird movement, but uh, basically she is the one that elaborated this concept in a sociological term. And in, the, in her first use, she didn't make a definition, but she said that it meant to be, or to mean the hate killing perpetrated but by men against females. And then a little bit later, she has been changing uh, some parts of her definition. Um, the latest one uh, from 2011. So after that, she has also worked together with other, with other activists and, and, and uh, academics. And they have also developed uh, like joint uh, definitions so for instance, with Jane Caputi, they, they define, it, define it, it as the murder of women by men motivated by hatred, contempt, pleasure, or a sense of ownership of women. Um, then uh, this famous uh, book, like the landmark book on, on femicide uh, came to, to be in 1992 and there, uh, it was defined by Diana Russell and Jill Radford as the misogynist killing of women by men. And this book was very important, particularly for the Mexican context, because um, by, by the early 90s, there were a series of murders uh, on girls uh, going on in the northern city of uh, Mexico called Ciudad Juarez. So many people were trying to make sense of what these killings were about. So uh, the mother of the of the women that were that were being killed in in this uh, city of Ciudad Juarez uh, went to the street and they started to make a protest because they wanted to know what was going on with their children. And in this context, they asked um, an anthropologist called Marcela Lagarde to help them to make sense of what was going on in that region, why these girls were, were being killed. And that's when Lagarde gets to know the work of um, Diana Russell and Judith Radford and elaborates um, the, the killings of uh, Ciudad Juarez within the frame of femicide. But what she does is to also translate this concept into the Mexican context and she uh, and to the Spanish-speaking context, and she translates the word as feminicide. 
because she thinks that femicide in Spanish at least uh, only means the opposite uh, of homicide. So let's say the homicide only applies toward the killing of any men and femicide to the killing of any women, which uh, for her perspective will depoliticize uh, the word uh, as intended to be. And also she stresses uh, or she frames uh, the term of feminicide within the language of human rights, because for her, I mean, she she's an advocate for human rights. Um, so she talked about feminicide as um, um, detrimental to the right of, uh, of a, a, a life free of violence of women. And also she points out two important things that it's uh, the tolerance of society that these crimes occur because there is a society that is tolerant towards that violence. And then there is also state responsibility. Um, then uh, we have another um, important figure, uh, Julia Monares Fregoso, also working on, on, the, on the feminicides in these um, Ciudad Juarez cases. Uh, she also works uh, with the feminicide frame uh, because she thinks that it's also uh, a matter of human rights and it's a matter of um, a structural uh, patriarchal society or, uh, an, or a masculine size state. And what I find in her definition or use of feminicide interesting is the use of the femininus. Uh, because that's going to be very important, at least for, for me, uh, what does uh, feminicide refers to. So she makes also a little bit of the etymological uh, meaning of feminicide in the sense of the femininus and how, um, yeah, how, how it interplays in, in defining feminicide. And also it is important to mention that she was one of the first uh, uh, activists doing a database on femicide. So actually, um, this is going to be really interesting and important. Uh, then we have also Ana Carcedo and, and Montserrat Sagón in Costa Rica, although no, not both of them are from Costa Rica. They prefer at the beginning to translate uh, the Spanish, uh, the, the English word to Spanish, like literally. So they translate the word fe uh, femicide into femicidio. Um, and they also made uh, a definition. Uh, later on, um, Montserrat Sagot or, and, and Carcedo are gonna say that they don't uh, actually uh, mind to use either femicide or feminicide. It's just that what they did at the beginning. Um, and then we have another important um, figure in this debate, which is uh, Rita Laura Segato, which most of you are familiar with because she has been invited many times uh, to these discussions. And she also was part of this committee that went to Ciudad Juarez. Uh, she was like an, an international expert to try to to find out what was going on in, in North Mexico. And then she developed, she, she agreed with uh, Marcela Lagarde's, uh, Lagarde's um, proposals, but she also tried to go and to raise the problem uh, in a way that she is invited us to think in two ways of approaching femicide. Like, She's uh, developing a femi genocide um, in order to differentiate the killings that occur in the realm of the interpersonal nature and those of the impersonal nature. The, the interpersonal nature, for instance, is the one where you can identify either the, the individual perpetrator uh, and the victim, let's say, like. The most clear example is like intimate femicide, like partner kills the other party. But the impersonal nature is the kind I would say we were facing in, in northern Mexico in which we didn't know. Uh, uh, I mean, the individual women was not the, uh, the, the, the objective of the killing because there was like um, 
well, the, the easiest example is serial killers, maybe, that you cannot really identify one particular characteristic of a single perpetrator or victim. And this is gonna be helpful uh, in, the, in terms of the international landscape of the discussions of femicide. And finally, <laughs> in this introduction, I want to also bring uh, Rosalinda Fregoso and Cynthia Bejarano. They both are based in, in, in the US. They had a really like elaborated uh, definition of feminicide. Um, taking, uh, they are taking in consideration all these other theories that I just mentioned, particularly focusing on the um, uh, juridicians, activists, uh, politicians in the Americas. So what I what I like about them is their uh, the challenge to the north south um, travel of concepts. Oopsie, ah, oh, he's not here. Oh, oh. no, sorry. <laughs> I I I I have um. Now I cannot turn back. How do I go back? Mm. Okay. Mm. Okay, I am there. I I don't know how. <laughs> okay. Oops. Okay. So, uh, Rosalinda Fregoso and Cynthia Bejarano they use the term feminicide because they also uh, it, they bring the term feminicide into the English um, debate because they want to stress like the, uh, the influence of the Americas in the discussion, like not only like they have appropriated the term, but they have also uh, worked it through and actually contributed to the, to the discussion. So they are trying to, to challenge this north to south um, um, hierarchy in a way. And then we have some of the definitions of the United Nations, um, meaning that the term of femicide has already, and I am using femicide because it's the word they are using. Uh, they are usually these big um, organizations. They are aware of the phenomenon in the Americas and in other parts of the world, but it's still they use the word femicide. And in, in some in some um, in some areas, they they use it in a very limited sense, although they are conscious that. It's um, about it. So, just an advertisement here. I have a, a paper <laughs> that is going to address all these um, jumping of, of theories. And I don't have too much time. So, first of all, uh, the term was created in the Global South. I, have, I hope it's, um, it's clear that it wasn't created itself in the Global South, but it has uh, evolved in or has found a fertile ground in, in the Americas so that today one cannot speak of feminicide without considering the great contributions uh, by feminist theorists, activists and politicians from that region, or at least that's my understanding. So part of this uh, decolonial practice comes also from this, like taking uh, seriously these, these theories produced uh, and activism um, in the Global South. Um, it is obvious that this phenomenon is not only uh, happening in the global south, um, because the crimes, uh, sexist and gender crimes are not exclusive heritage of, 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 of Mexico or of the Americas. Um, there, is, um, there is abundant documentation referring to other, to other countries, including Germany uh, and other parts of the globe. The only thing is that Mexico became well known of this phenomenon due to the case of Ciudad Juarez. Um, so we are not digging into this, but uh, feminicide is a complex, uh, is a complex phenomenon, it's a complex concept which addresses other problems and other concepts such as uh, patriarchy, uh, violence against women, gender-based violence, men, uh, women, what does that mean? Uh, so then why I'm using the term feminicide within the brackets and I'm using this in order to avoid um, the breakdown um, or, or stopping conversations because 
there was a heated debate amongst um, uh, theoreticians in the in the Americas, like, um, sorry, I put the alarm, and so now I am over the 50 minutes. Um, so yeah, femicide and feminicide can be understood as the same. Yes, uh, some people don't care and they use both interchangeably, or it can be that some people prefer to use uh, one over the other because of political reasons, let's say feminicide, because it stresses like the, the input from the Americas, or let's say femicide, because they say, no, that's the word in, in English, that like that should be the word when we are speaking in, in, so it's also a political stance. And then we have the third option that I call the third option is uh, to use feminicide as proposed by Cynthia Bejarano, uh, um, Fregoso and Bejarano to, in order to break down the epistemic hierarchy north to south. So what I do in all this is like in order to uh, to avoid these uh, fights, I use feminicide in brackets. And when I speak, I, I say feminicide because it, 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 yeah, there is no other way. And because I prefer to use uh, feminicide because also the um, theoretical implications of it. But um, in writing, I use that. So because I want above of all uh, enable discussion and conversation. So I didn't get to go to the part of Germany, so maybe we can just um, discuss that um, in the in the in the final part. And here are some, yeah, I think it's 50 minutes is too little <laughs> to discuss all these subjects. And um, sorry, I don't I don't get to to get there. Maybe in the Q and A question. But what if we? give you three minutes more and um, um, because you already have built it up and um, prepared it so well. So, and <laughs> okay. so three minutes, <laughs> sorry for the other part uh, because I am taking some time. So first of all, I would say that uh, it is needed the active, uh, uh, the practice of active listening so that's what we we can learn from also activism in 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 other in, in global south. Uh, and meaning active listening is a, a hard thing to do, even though it sounds like easy, like we. Really. And then also, as I mentioned, think and recognize the work or 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 scholars from the global south. And when I say think with, is to really engage with the productions of the others, and not only just like okay, I want to be to look fancy and then I'm gonna quote this and that, but no, to really engage and it's valid to criticize also, but like really think together and think with the others. And then also try, try to challenge these North uh, global structures, not only in academia, but also in activism. And it goes from the level of individuality to the level of communities in general. And also what I heard uh, discussing in the last times is also not to romanticize the global south because that is, is so detrimental to the activism uh, that many people are doing uh, because it's uh, again paternalizing in a way the other, right? Um, and what important thing that maybe the other panelists are gonna go deeper in this is to expose the structures and networks that enable feminicide to happen in your own territory and abroad. Uh, because the, the global north in a way is also responsible in the way that has, um, has to be, to respond to acts of colonialism in other parts of, of, of the world that is still going on. Of, of course, there is, it's not the same colonialism as many centuries ago, or well, in, in some regions centuries ago, um, but it's still a colonial attitude. Mm, so, and also make visible the power relations in the discourse on feminicide in Europe and particularly in Germany. So also work in your own local territories and also see how these uh, power relations are being built and challenge or not challenge. Uh, because I think it's important, and I mentioned that in, in many years ago, 
feminicide can be also in a way lost from its uh, feminist input if we are not uh, strong enough or smart enough because there are some movements that are also ap um, approaching of this, uh, of this fight and not making it uh, feminist in, in court. Um, so, um, and also this idea of co-learning that means like this um, knowledge and agendas have to emerge from the meeting of togetherness. I don't know how to say that. Like, um, and also remember always to work with complexity. I mean, there are different times. We are living in different times at the same time in this in the same region. So we need to be aware of that. Space doesn't have the same meaning for every one of us, even if we are sharing the same room. Um, so try to always think to have presence. I mean, I know that it's complex to achieve or to work with complexity, but it's something that we don't, we need to think. And complexity is always to struggle. So that's also important to not be afraid, afraid of the struggle. And yeah, and finally, there is no only one formula. There are many, but they are coming up from collaboration and conversation. So the list is long, and that's the only ones I wanted to, to mention. So thank you, and I am looking forward to Q&A. Thank you very, very much, Aleda, um, for, um, for sharpening these um, difference in the terms and make, it, make them productive already with the proposal of the Nian brackets um, in order to, yeah, to, ha to have also to have a sharp, sharper understanding of the um, complexity of suppression of patriarchal violence. I think that helps a lot. And thank you also for the long list you gave us to work with. Um, and um, as a moderator, I am sorry to have um, forced you into that 15 minutes uh, scheme. And I would um, like to give us a proposal uh, or to propose um, that we won't chase you through your presentations, but rather that um, in this conference, there is a break from uh, 12 to 13 or 12 to, to 1 o'clock. Um, and that everyone who would like to stay with us in the, in the discussion then could stay, but that we don't cut your uh, your presentation. So, Tiago and Sohila, don't worry, we won't uh, cut yours because that because we are now late. Um, so, yeah, um, there is um, one question from from the chat, and one that I would like to ask you in order to deepen more the understanding. Um, and. Um, I would like to ask you about, because you said um, that the term feminineness was really relevant for you, but I could you explain why? Is it the minus and making it small or is it um, some other uh, significance? And uh, Sabine asked that uh, if the uh, mothers are in Ciudad Juarez, if they approached Marcela Lagarde um, or how how these connection uh, work. So that's a bit a uh, historical question. Um, and I would like if you could just tell us two or three sentences on how you um, estimate the situation in Germany. Thanks. So, yeah, feminineness, um, Ciudad Juarez, and Germany. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And um, first, I'm going to answer the, the question of Sabine because I was looking into the chat and then I resolved it, but it's not true. So yes, um, I mean, there is a conference where Marcela Lagarde states like how she ended up uh, discovering the term of femicide in the first instance. And then she explains about uh, her meeting with the mothers of um, the victims of, of Ciudad Juarez. So yes, it was like literally asked to her, I don't know in which terms, but she narrates the story like, yes please help us in a way to make sense of this. Um, and then um, the, 
You say something, Julia. Sorry, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, and then the, the the question about the the NI. Um, can you repeat the question? <laughs> sorry. Um, um, I wanted. Sorry. Um, I wanted to to know more about the feminines because you said that mm -hmm. it's so important. Um, yeah, and the German situation. Okay, yeah, about the feminines then. Okay, so the feminines is not necessarily, I mean, yes, fe um, feminicide or the feminine, when, when you do the et etymological analysis of the word, you come to the idea of the feminine, which is um, an attribute to something, I mean, in terms of, of gender, actually the grammatical gender of something, but then, then that also has developed in gender studies, uh, like how this uh, gender from the grammatics has come to, to, to the term of the gender in, in, the, um, in the social world, let's say. So this feminine is, is what stresses like what a society has considered to be feminine. So there is not only one perception of what is the feminine, but it's like, how it is constructed. So the feminine is, can be attached to the sex or not. And that's why it is important in this context of feminicide, meaning that uh, what is at stake is like the construction of the feminine and the value of, of this femininity that in this uh, modern Western society is this duality between the feminine and the masculine. Uh, so, and that allow us to think on feminicide in terms of the subject that, that is being feminicized, uh, that is perceived as someone as feminine and de therefore less valuable in a sense, or that in society needs to, to, to act in a certain way. And if you are not behaving in that, in that way, in that way, you are also against like the, the the guidelines of this of this particular society. So that's why I I use that, and I think that's why actually also was stressed by by Lagarde, and and, and more particularly by <clears throat> Monares. So I don't know if that helps you. Um, and I don't I am not an English specialist in in the language, so I am not really sure if all these movements also happen with the term femicide in English. So that's that's something we we need to to ask also so people that are also that um, really like English, exactly. yeah. because from my perspective, because I am already embedded on these discourses, it's not any more visible in the English uh, use of it. And then we go to to the German part and um, uh, you said um, how is this happening or or how can you learn? Mm, I thought if you could just give us a really short view on on what's happening in Germany or how you would estimate these struggles yeah. that maybe we could also um, yeah uh, speak about that in the panel afterwards, in the panel discussion. discussion. Okay, in Germany, at least my first impressions were when I started to address the subject in Germany is that there were some, the, some things that for me were, uh, again, a little bit colonial in the sense that at the beginning, uh, Germany didn't accept that this phenomenon occurred in, in Germany and it's still officially the German state hasn't accepted that this phenomenon occurs in Germany, although uh, since, 2000, since 2008, something like that, um, Germany has <clears throat> actively be present in the fight against feminicide or femicide in the Americas. I mean, using using the paradigm of femicide, they have they have been so far at least 10, 11, uh, also seminars organized by the German Green Party to fight against this phenomenon. So it's not like they don't know about the subject, it's just that they don't see it. But then this, this blindness cannot be blamed on, we don't know. 
from my perspective, it's also like colonialism does because you, you are blind to not see what is happening in your own territory. Only it happens in the others. And also you see this in, in the academia in terms of how many uh, uh, theses or final papers are written about uh, femicide in the Americas by scholars. Like from my perspective, I call it like the exotic other because it's like, oh, killings are happening in, in Ciudad Juarez, Let's just say, which is important, yes. But how do you write about that? So the, the numbers are really high in comparison to how much work has been done on the killing of women in Germany. There are a few, uh, not all use the frame of feminicide. Actually, feminicide it has um, just recently started to be named or used as a frame in Germany. So this is something that is that I see happening in, in Germany. And then we have also this idea of um, the, the dangerous other, what I call the dangerous other, which is okay, if feminicide is happening in Germany, even if you are from the left party, I have many friends and, and the first answer is, of course, it's happening among the migrant communities. Or uh, we, the Germans, we are not, but we don't do that because we are, we, we, we are already feminist and, and, and stuff like that. So either these killings occur in migrant communities or these are perpetrated by migrant men against German women. So these narratives are really strong. And sometimes in the global, in, in, the, in the North Europe, the idea is, okay, this happens, but in, the, in South Europe, let's say Spain, let's say Italy, let's say Portugal. Again, you are like othering the problem. And, and, I'm, and of course I am talking in general trends because of course there is, small communities that are starting to criticize that. But I think that that's good, but we need to look into the bigger picture of the discussion. Um, should I leave the other things for later? Thank you, but that was really, uh, I appreciate this critique really very much. Um, and it was also new for me that there is like German parties intervening also in the feminine, in this, discourse and also political field of fight against feminicide in Germany, in Mexico while not acknowledging feminicide in Germany. And for sure, the racialization of a migrant men uh, in this context of uh, always um, putting them in the perpetrator's place, that's also a really important issue uh, with post-colonial tendencies for sure. Thank you for that. So yeah, Tiago, um, we would like to give you the word and the screen and um, yeah, let you show us how the concept, the struggles against um, trans feminicide um, arose in uh, Argentina and about your decolonial critique from, from your situatedness. Thanks for that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's morning slash night in here. Uh, so good morning. Um, thank you for the invitation and for having me here. It's really an honor to be here and participate. And Aleida, that intervention was amazing. I will give you my time for you to continue because it really was amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, well, like Julia says, uh, I will talk about the visibilization of tra transvesticides, travesticidios, and transfemicides as categories of gender-based violence that should be in transnational feminist fights agendas. Sorry, I <laughs> didn't make a visual presentation. Um, recently, with another two trans investigators, Kimi Ramos and Sebastián Sokaiki, we did a project of revision, diagnosis, and monitoring of the impact of public politics and effects of the pandemic in transgender, transvestite, and non-binary population in my country, Argentina, in the center of legal and social studies. During this project, we interviewed a lot of trans activists and some cisgender activists 
to take knowledge about living conditions and most urgent and serious problems for trans, transvesti and non-binary people in the last year. Uh, our conclusion after the interviews and the investigation is that the most serious problem for our community is gender-based violence because we understand the gender-based violence as a structural problematic that came in several ways like discrimination, exclusion, rejection, ridiculization, precarization, and psychological and physical violence, among other expressions of violence. Just in order to clarify some terminology, the gender category travesti, transvesti in Argentina for us is a political category that we choose to identify with because of what it means to us for our history. The, the colonial feminism has opened political paths which drew the lines of deconstruction and cultural reconstruction of gender roles and gender expression in social structure and dynamics and one of those lines conceives feminism as an intersectional, plural, and empathic movement, understanding for a fair society, one where not only cisgender people have the right to exist, express themselves, have a family, go to school, be a congressist, and mostly be loved and respected. And that's the line I'm, go I'm going to use. For people who identify outside of cisgender and binary identities, and for the LGBTQ plus community, feminist organizations and collectives of cisgender women have been indispensable allies. But it's necessary for me to say that there are several expressions of TERF feminism. The, it means trans exclusionary radical feminism and biologist feminism. That's why today I'm going to emphasize the importance of the concepts travesticidio y transfemicidio, transvesticide and transfemicide, besides the concepts of femicide or feminicide. The concept of femicide is the extreme and final expression of gender-based violence that reflects the power and impunity of the patriarchal system. But it's a figure that represents one of the gender-based violence last final expressions, because that concept indicates that an operation of structural violence is being perpetrated by a man to a woman. And I say it like that because in most cases, society conceives only one expression of masculinity and femininity, and those are the cisgender ones. That puts gender-based violence in a biological framework of discussion, or in other words, normativity tell you that you only could be masculine or feminine if the sex you were assigned to at birth is the one you also identify with as your gender in daily life. And there are many feminisms and cultures that reject everything outside that. There are several expressions of gender, among them masculinity, femininity, and non-binary trans and transvestite identities. And that's why I would like to talk about the figures uh, of transvesticide, transfemicide in the framework of the green wave uh, and the race and boom of feminist, feminist movements in Argentina. I'm sorry, my English is <laughs> not very good, but I promise you I'm doing my best. Uh, the concept of travesticidio and transfemicidio is possible to enunciate because for us, trans and transvestite people are really eman emancipatory and anti-patriarchal feminisms has its start point from being able to be conceived in a decolonial and intersectional way. I say intersectional because for me, it's impossible to think about feminism 
without a class perspective, a social vulnerability perspective, an LGBTQ plus perspective, among many other perspectives. A decolonial and intersectional feminisms, feminism is capable of fighting for a society that values and registers the rights and the lives of racialized people, trans people, native communities, sexual workers, physical and neurodiverse people, just for naming some of them. Here in Argentina, the political participation and the organization of people in the streets is very strong. Activism is a fundamental part of our social dynamics and our social construction. Although there are many types of feminisms and not all support the same causes like the abolitionist and regulationist movements, Sometimes those differences are put aside in order to fight for common causes, like the voluntary interruption of pregnancy rights, which started the green wave among other causes, such as the uh, Ni Una Menos movement, which also started the green wave, demanding justice for femicides here in, in Argentina. In our culture, that social participation is essential for the legislation and implementation of public politics that recognize our human rights and improve our quality of life. Some examples of that are the law of equal marriage, which we approved in 2010, the gender identity law, which is one of a kind law in the world and provide us the right to use our chosen names and gender in our official documentation and recognize us a uh, right the, for the medical coverage of our hormonal treatments and surgeries for free, among many other important and fundamental things. And this law was approved in 2012. The recently approved voluntary termination of pregnancy law and the Micaela law of gender training for public employees and institutions that was approved in 2018 after the terrible femicide of a 21-year-old activist who was brutally raped and murdered in 2017. She was part of an organization and she was part of the movement Ni Una Menos. The case was viral and really shocking and the demand for justice led to several political actions that we carry out to achieve this law, which is very, very important for us. The conquest of rights in my country are the result of our history of collective and plural activism and political militancy that took the life of a lot of people who dedicated their time and in a lot of cases, their lives to fight for a better world like Loana Berkins, Diana Sacajan, Maite Amaya, Micaela Garcia, and many, many others. Currently here in Argentina, we have a Ministry of Women, Gender and Diversity as a result of decades of struggling and fighting for the recognition of our rights. But also currently, although we have politics directed to attend problems like gender-based violence, those politics are made by cisgender people and also for cisgender people. We have a phone line which receives complaints and denounces and cases of gender-based violence. But in our investigation, we realized that of about 40,000 calls, just 26 are from, from trans people. Just 26 out of 40,000. And that number do not reflect that trans people don't suffer violence. Those numbers reflect two things. One is that trans folks are afraid to call. And that is because the people who respond to those calls discard the cases for not being cases of, of gender-based violence and then hang up the phone. Why is that? Because in most of, of feminist conception, the gender is based in the biology. In other words, in the genitals. For most Argentinians, and I dare to say everywhere citizens, a trans woman or a trans man 
can't denounce gender-based violence. The feminist movements in Argentina has reached a strong and massive mobilization that supports several causes all over the country. And although most of the causes are cisgender causes in the last years, uh, the trans and non-binary agenda has reached visibility. And in these days, the trans and non-binary community is a political actor that the state, the, go the government, the Congress and social organization recognize and in some cases here. That's why we could do our investigation in the first place, but it's not enough. What we have to say, among other things, is that the gender-based violence affects us too, is not inflicted to cisgender women only, and it's equally dangerous and lethal because it takes our lives too, and our lives matter such as much as cisgender lives. The category of travesticidio and transfemicidio is a final expression of a violence change chain that trans and transvestite people are submit to by a binary system which exclude any gender expression besides this gender woman and men. And I think it's time for the self-called decolonial and intersectional feminisms to in incorporate it into their agenda. Just like we all do with the femicide causes in the several struggles we fought in order to get justice. We need to be on the agenda because our lives are at stake. And I would like to say to those who identify with the trans exclusionary radical feminisms that we are not gender traitors or dangerous for the society. You are dangerous for us. And we are right here and we demand justice for all the women, transgender, transvestite, non-binary and gender dissident people who we took away from us by our common enemy, the patriarchy and by a hate crime that is structural. So I think that is all. I'm sorry if I use more time. And I apologize for my English really. It's really early and I'm really bad with this language, sorry. Thank you very much, Tiago. Um, I feel really touched and moved by your contribution. No worries for your English, it's better than mine. And, and I also took that um, task of, of moderating the panel. Um, and thank you also for stating that for sure you are here and um, queer trans people are part of at least our society or let's fight for having a society where there's part for where every life matters um and in your listening to you to your contribution for me the notion of biologism and colonialism became so much closer because then i felt yeah biolog biologism uh, or biologization has always been a tool in colonization. We know that from the racialization of, um, of the colonialized people, but also the biologization of the supposed binary construction of, of gender um, and some kind of or colonialist women or women of colonializers being complicit with that. So um, some kind also of anti-colonial or colonial feminism could emerge. I Can you elaborate more on that? So is that the decolonial position also to um, deconstruct the biologization of sex and gender um, and and weave it, weave it in, in something in, in an intersectional and anti-patriarchal feminism? Um, I think that's it for now. Um, another question that arose was, does um, the, the feminicidio debate, so is it femicide, is it feminicide, did that matter in your struggles? Because we thought 
okay, when Mexico says it's feminicidio, then probably whole Latin America says feminicidio. And we were another time astonished that it's not the case. So yeah, maybe the deconstruction um, of uh, biodigitization in, in the decolonial perspective. And a small remark on the need, please. <laughs> I, I have a question. Can I answer in Spanish? Yes. For sure you can. And then um, I'd like to ask everyone um, of our listeners to um, take the translation uh, option and click on English. So thank you. Listen to the translation. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Bueno. Okay. I believe this cross is much more significant, is, is much more important uh, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's a social control. So it finalizes uh, in a control to check the, the uh, mm. So for me, it's a clear point that you have to think about uh, coloniality and uh, the violence against. You have to think it like a, a, a social uh, construction, something really dynamic. It, it can, it can uh, change constantly. So you have to, you have to adapt all the time. In this sense, I believe that um, the the gener the construction of gender are passed in a way intersectional um, down to many sectionalities and perspectives, purpose of class, the the social life, the bodies. So there's very a lot of Oh, types that are, and so how we can construct. So for me, therefore, it's very important to understand the concepts of uh, transvencidio, the structural, the, the, the structural uh, violence against the, the feminine. E, Okay, sorry for everyone. I my brain can't cope. There's some there are violations. Um, there are violations to correct the the gender. So there's violations that want to happen to kind of correct the orientation of the person, for example, or how they identify themselves. So in regard of the uh, term. Uh, Feminicide, feminicidio, or femicidio in Argentina, for example, we are using more femicidio because there are crimes that are there are crimes that it's the same. Uh, sorry, I couldn't follow. Would you like to do it or did he already answer it? Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. everyone, Aleda had a question backstage um, and we would um, My question is now we are in the Spanish channel or are we in, in English? We're in so the background. Podrías hablar también español. Como sea. Then everyone oh. should get the, yeah. No. <laughs> There's another person who commented on my question. So two people in one. So my question uh, for you, uh, Tiago, is uh, to you and the trans community. When I started my investigation, 
a friend of mine, a companiera uh, transgender, she says that, that uh, the feminicidio doesn't uh, present us, it doesn't show us. So, so she's a woman, a transgender woman, and, and, and she doesn't feel represented by this term. Uh, so Tiago dice, Tiago says, uh, here in uh, Argentina, there is a particular particularity, uh, very big. So uh, many trans uh, women, they don't see themselves as women. They see themselves as transvestites. So he's giving examples now. I don't know these people. So social shock. They talk about um, the necessity to to uh, talk about uh, the the women the, the cat category of women. Uh, and it, it's necessary to have a trans category. So the, the binary uh, gender. So I believe when we want to talk about feminicides, it's possible that some of the femi feministas uh, feel trans, like trans feminists feel, um, feel seen, but um, the, it, the theories don't, don't necessarily give the value that um, that a feminicidio that happens to a transgender person doesn't show itself. So not even thinking about the media. So they're kind of murders, they're completely invisible. Therefore, it's uh, an operation to visibilize um, it's to make it more visible and give it some importance and um and yeah especially in argentina uh, we're going to that direction porque uh, here we want to just refer to ourselves as the transvesti it's a lot more complex okay cool. Sorry for the translate, I mean, issues are for the translators. Sorry, Anna. Um, thank you, Tiago, for um, these explications. I would like to give uh, the word finally to Suhela. Um, change the continent, change also the perspective, um, and give you the floor. I think there is already many parallels and points of connection that arose. So yeah, thanks. Thank you, Julia. And, and thank you so much to my panelists for already giving us such a wonderful foundation to work from and just for all the incredible context and ideas you've already presented. So I'm speaking very much from an African context here. Um, and then what I want to speak about today is give you a little bit of context on femicide and the material conditions of uh, women and queer people in South Africa, then explore a little bit what a decolonial approach to femicide could look like, um, and then just sort of conclude by, by thinking about what the way forward for all of us could be in, in building a transnational and a decolonial response to femicide. So, so, so to start off, in terms of the context of femicide in South Africa, um, South Africa is a really interesting test case because on the one hand, we have very progressive law and policy, uh, largely as a result of our history uh, of apartheid and the discrimination that it engendered. And so in crafting a new democratic constitutional order, the very, extensive effort was put into to moving away from that, that discrimination. Um, and so we, we have employment equity systems that prioritize women. We have very progressive and broad laws regarding sexual assault and rape um, to protect people from a wide range of conduct. Uh, 
we're the first country in the world to prohibit discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation and gender, um, gender read to include transgender people, and the first country in the world to legalize same-sex marriage. Transgender people can access free surgery and healthcare at certain state hospitals and can, can legally change their gender markets. And so all of this is really wonderful, but on the other hand, most the, the material conditions of most women and most queer people remain pretty terrible. So a large amounts live in, in incredible poverty as a result of South Africa's just gross levels of inequality. We regularly rank as amongst the most financially unequal country in the world. And then more specific, I think, to, to, to what we're talking about today in terms of violence, seven women are killed every day in South Africa. We rank fourth in the world for our rate of femicide. Uh, and we are the country in which the term corrective rape, which describes the rape of queer people to convert them to heterosexuality, originated. Um, and so it is clearly not a safe place in many ways to be queer or to be a woman, despite the legal protection that we have. Um, and in engaging why this is so, it's obviously a difficult question to answer. And there is, of course, there are, of course, cultural and religious reasons behind this. Uh, many sectors of South African society are, are deeply conservative and patriarchal. But more than that, and I think more specific to our conversation today, I think there are a number of clues in our history um, that inform why we have this level of violence today. And that then brings me to sort of the next topic I wanted to address, which is this idea of how do we decolonize our approach to femicide and to feminism. And when I when I first started speaking to the organizers, I was I was a little doubtful initially about how you could be decolonial as citizens of a colonizer, not a colony, as as predominantly Germans, because as as a number of scholars describe, decolonization is not a metaphor, right? It's not a metaphor for feminism or human rights or leftism or any of the, the really nice things that we want. It is a specific response to colonization, which was a process in which one society endeavored to rule and to transform another. And so decolonization must include the physical process of overcoming colonial rule through things like independence struggles and the rejection of imperialism and neocolonialism, but also of a more epistemological decolonization. So rejecting that imposed transformation of society, rejecting the fact that indigenous ways of life and ways of knowledge and ways of law and justice have been imposed um, or have been undermined rather. So if that's what decolonization is, then how do you as former colonizers participate in this process of decentering the global north and recentering uh, indigenous people, Africa, the global south? Um, and I can conceive of, of a role to be played, and I think of something that is quite important to be done as, as Germans, as citizens of former uh, colonizers. So I can draw a direct line from the Dutch and English colonization of South Africa, as well as apartheid, to the deaths of women in South Africa, not just during those processes, but now, currently. Um, so so let, let me explain. I think we often understand apartheid and colonialism as very deep, deeply racist systems, but they were also incredibly sexist and homophobic. So uh, it is a sort of legal level in South Africa, uh, the apartheid government, colonial governments implemented laws that prevented women from inheriting, from owning land, from voting, from being traditional leaders and just participating in society publicly. They also criminalized same-sex relations 
And the apartheid government in particular was a world leader in conversion therapy using techniques that we now as a country recognize as, as torture. So these practices and these laws often didn't exist before colonists and the apartheid government brought them into being. And so I think in that way, we can say that apartheid and colonialism in South Africa institutionalized patriarchy, institutionalized cis-heteropatriarchy. But I think on top of that, they also created the conditions which, in which violence flourishes. So um, just more, more history, one of the things that was really prevalent during apartheid and colonialism was the migrant labor system. Because of course, one of the core aims of colonialism is to extract labor and to extract resources, which in South Africa were the mines, precious metals, diamonds. Um, and so you had the system in which African men were forced to leave the villages and go work in the cities, in mines, in, in truly horrible conditions through things like uh, prison sentences and punitive taxes if they didn't do so, or the fact that the law just prohibited African people from owning and working the land, which meant that the only way to survive was to go to the mines. And what this migrant labor system did was essentially tear apart completely family structures. Uh, so too did the prevalence of HIV and AIDS, which has ravaged sub-Saharan Africa, um, and which we have since learned in South Africa, at least, was purposefully introduced into townships in which people of color lived by the apartheid government, along with uh, incredibly powerful and cheap drugs uh, in order to prevent the youth from mobilizing politically. So you have uh, things that tear families apart. You have the use of drugs, which comes with the prevalence of, of gangsterism. You also have a purposefully inferior education system for about 90% of society, for Indian people, for, for mixed race people, for black people. You also have a culture of state sanctioned violence, which I think seeps into society. And of course, massive levels of poverty and inequality. And I think all of this societal trauma and the effects that it continues to have today contributes not only to a deeply patriarchal and homophobic society, but also one that responds with violence. And so we know for, for a fact that generally those most affected by gender-based violence in South Africa, either as perpetrators or as victims, are generally those living in poverty, generally those with poor education levels, with histories of drug use, of trauma, of broken families. And we can see from the discussion we've just had that colonialism and apartheid have contributed to creating the type of society, uh, not exclusively, but have definitely contributed to creating a society in which gender-based violence and femicide are far more likely. Um, and then what I wanna do now is bring this conversation, I think, to a more German context. So South Africa's good neighbor, Namibia, was a German colony. And so, of course, Germany extracted labor and resources from Namibia, imposed its own laws and values on Namibia whilst undermining existing practices, brutalized Namibians. In particular, Germany committed what it has only recently accepted was a genocide against the Nama and Ovaherero people in Namibia. Uh, the Nama Herero genocide wiped out more than 80% of the over Herero people. That's 80% of an entire ethnic group and 50% of the Nama people. And there was also widespread use of prison enclosures and concentration camps in which even women and children were kept in, in truly brutal conditions. And what's really interesting here is that Germany has not yet even apologized for this genocide, although recently, last year, in fact, finally accepted that it would do so, although we are still waiting for that apology. And Germany has also refused to pay compensation for that genocide, even upon accepting responsibility. Instead, in a, in a very paternalistic way, it's offered to contribute to development in areas where Nama and Herero people live. And so I think while 
colonialism has officially ended in Namibia, uh, and Namibia is a post-colonial decolonized state, there is still to me that continuity between what Germany did then and, and the ways in which women and queer people's lives are affected now. Uh, so Namibia has a population of about two and a half million people. It's a very small country, but about 200 cases of domestic violence are reported to the police per month. Uh, and in a period of about 18 months, there were something like one and a half thousand cases of rape. Uh, and activists on the ground attribute this to the fact that there is widespread unemployment and poverty as a result of that colonial past. Um, as well as the, the long-term legacies of apartheid. They also had a migrant contract labor systems institutionalized under German colonial rule that separated families and, and harmed the social fabric uh, of, of society. Um, and even in the anti-colonial struggle, gender relations were, were quite fraught. So I think it's fair to conclude that to some extent, at least women were killed then and women are killed now in part because of the material conditions that Germany caused as a colonizer. Uh, and accepting responsibility for that is incredibly important too. I think I am running out of time, but I do still have so much to say. So I'm going to try to just uh, speed up a little uh, and summarize as I go. But in the same way that I think we, we have to acknowledge that continuity uh, in terms of Namibia and the role that Germany once played there, we also have to look at the role that Germany plays now in providing significant aid, support, and legitimacy to Israel. Uh, and I know that this is a, a very contentious issue, especially in Europe, uh, and so I do just want to preface this discussion with a few points. Uh, the first is to say that I agree completely that the Jewish people deserve recompense for the atrocities they suffered under the Holocaust, and that they still do to an extent endure as a result of structural anti-Semitism. And I also want to say that I agree that the Jewish people deserve a place in which they feel safe and are able to self-determine. But none of that, I think, in any way precludes us from concluding that Palestine is occupied by a colonial force and that Israel is implementing a system that the South African government, liberation heroes like Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu, as well as organizations like the United Nations Human Rights Commission, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Palestinian territories, and the African Union as a whole recognizes is apartheid. Um, and I think that it's important here to know that this isn't a particularly contentious or controversial point for Africa or for Africans. And as far back as the drafting of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which is the core human rights treaty in Africa, uh, and was drafted as the first waves of decolonization swept through the continent, Liberation leaders in African states that had just achieved agency decided to include in its preamble opposition to colonization, apartheid, and the Zionism that was occurring in Israel. Um, and so I think there's very clear recognition there that the cause of Palestinians is the cause of colonized people, is the cause of Africans. So, so how does that then relate to gender-based violence or to femicide? Well, the UN Population Fund estimates that 37% of women in Palestine are survivors of gender-based violence. And in the Gaza Strip in particular, this number increases to 51%, uh, which is more than half of the women in a territory. Uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women in 2005 identified two causes for, for these high levels. The first just being traditional patriarchal norms, and the second being occupation and its consequences. Because occupation has exacerbated gender inequality, it has normalized violence, it has caused a long economic depression, and men who are now frustrated, unable to fulfill their expected role in a patriarchal society as providers and as protectors, but also legal reform is obviously stunted, as is activism and support services under conditions of occupation and war. Uh, 
And of course, Palestinian women are regularly detained, beaten, tortured, and killed by, by Israeli security forces. And so to me, what this means then is when you map feminicide or femicide in Germany, a decolonial perspective for colonizers means you can't just look at Germany's numbers. You need to look also at Namibia and the other places you colonized and consider how your actions there led to women dying then and now. And you also need to look at Palestine and ask how many Palestinians Palestinian women are dying or are displaced because of Germany's actions. Um, which I think gives us a good starting point then to consider a transnational and decolonized response to femicide. Um, so, so the project of decolonization and, and recentering the global South, I think requires us to understand that firstly, it's not just the global North who has something to teach the global South which unfortunately is how it happens so often. Um, a Western NGO comes to the South and teaches us how to be better, how to take care of ourselves better. I think that we must reject that lens and we must understand that in many ways, mass movements in the global South are far more effective than they are in the North. Uh, and also that progress has been made in the South that has not necessarily been made elsewhere. Uh, just a, like a small example of this is that I read very recently that New Zealand was the first country to grant maternity leave to people who miscarry. It was all over newspaper headlines, all over Twitter. And then a few days later, I learned that this wasn't true at all and that a range of countries had already done so, um, often with far more favorable terms than New Zealand, India, South Africa, and the Philippines being just a few. And those countries just so happen to be mostly populated by, by brown people. Uh, and so, so we definitely see a problem of progress being painted as a inherently Western, a Northern thing. So, so what can you learn from, from the Global South in terms of opposing femicide? In South Africa in particular, I think where we've been successful has been in taking advantage of our culture of mass protest. So we have pretty much yearly massive protests of thousands of people protesting gender-based violence and femicide and, and forwarding certain demands to the state. We've also had really impressive solidarity between trade unions, which are very powerful here. The majority of our workforce is unionized and poor people's movements, um, as well as student movements. and. All of them have come around to supporting feminist causes. Uh, a few years back, we disrupted a meeting of the World Economic Forum, uh, have also disrupted parliament on a number of times to protest gender-based violence. And as a result of these sort of steps, we've had femicide declared a national emergency and have had an extensive policy adopted to combat gender-based violence and femicide which in terms of a policy position includes protecting queer people and trans people. And uh, we've also had really, really nice budgetary allocations made to help support this fight against, against femicide. Um, as well as socioeconomic solutions, things like increased funding for shelters and improved employment opportunities for women. Uh, and something that I'm very proud of is, is the prevalence of restorative justice uh, which prioritizes reconciliation and restitution above punishment and prison time. Restorative justice has been popular here because it is linked very heavily to traditional African customary law, which in South Africa is one of our formally recognized sources of law. Um, in Namibia, last year, they launched shut it all down protests, which aim to just bring various parts of public life to a complete halt until steps were taken to, to remedy the gender-based violence problem there. And so, so this was essentially sort of a strike, stay home type movement and enjoyed significant success. Their demands have been accepted by the state and they're in the process of some degree of implementation, although we'll see how comprehensively that happens. But they've demanded a lot like focusing on shelters, increased budgetary allocations, 
better government responses to poverty and healthcare, and uh, scrapping the sodomy law to protect um, queer people and trans people. So I think it's important then to learn from the policies and work being done by activists, scholars, and even governments in the Global South. Although, uh, as a leader mentioned, Global South activism is not perfect and should not be uncritically romanticized. Uh, one of my greatest concerns as a police and prison abolitionist is how prevalent carceral feminism is in, in our movements, which is the view that prisons and policing are the best way to protect women and queer people. And so we often see as part of these protests, demands will center around uh, more focus by the police on capturing perpetrators, longer prison times. At some point, we even had a call for the return of the death penalty, which has been illegal here almost since, since we achieved democracy. Fortunately, it, it was not successful. Um, and I would love to talk more about abolitionism, but I don't think I, I have the time and maybe we can address it in questions. But the other big solution that I think we must criticize that is prevalent in large parts of the global south is a focus on international intervention and aid. You know, NGOs from the global north needing to come in, fund us and help us. And I mean, it's important to note, this isn't like always imposed against the will of the people. Very often our movements welcome those in the global south. But of course we know that, that these can be criticized very heavily, that aid is often conditional, it serves neo-colonial and imperialist aims. We know, for example, that the USA once justified its intervention in the Middle East as uh, necessary to protect women's rights. And so we can see feminism being weaponized to serve imperialist aims in that way. But even, even well-meaning intervention is often harmful because of this idea of superiority and the fact that global north activists often do not take the time to understand the actual context in which they operate and instead think that they can sort of impose empowerment in a very paternalistic way on the, the poor brown people. So that learning is important in that, I think, critical engagement beyond just engagement. But more than just learning from the South, I think a decolonial approach also requires solidarity in very real and very tangible ways. So like we discussed earlier, it means being aware of colonists' role in harming women then and now, and opposing in your work and your activism, not just misogyny, but also imperialism and, and neo-colonialism. It requires asking of yourself, I think, are you as Germans doing enough to pressure the government to apologize for the genocide that it committed in Namibia and to compensate Namibia? Are you doing enough to pressure the government to stop supplying the funds that buys weapons that kills Palestinian women? Are you or doing or did you do enough to stop the EU from blocking the TRIPS waiver that would have given the Global South the ability to manufacture COVID-19 vaccines and save the lives of, of countless women? And unfortunately, I think if the answer to any of those questions is no, then it begs a really important question about which women's lives you think are worth saving. And so I think I'm gonna wrap up there, but as an, as an ending note to this presentation, I do want to say that we want solidarity, not guilt. Uh, guilt does nothing for us as colonized people, but I think that solidarity has the very real ability to change the world and to change the, the relationships we currently engage in. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it for me. Um, boom, thank you very much, <laughs> you just did it all. <laughs> um, thank you for that super impressive, impressive uh, presentation, um, what at the end even connected to the COVID pandemic and the ongoing <laughs> violations and, and death and dying um, in, in, and there's, okay. I don't care, I don't go for that. Thank you very much for that. And say, thank you also for that kind of, in a way it wasn't a fist in the face, but a really obvious 
a proposal to say, okay, if you want to be to reclaim to have a colonial frame, decolonial framework, or to to be solidary with um, decolonial approaches, then um, and how are you connecting the work you're doing in Germany to the gender-based violence and and um, femicidal and transfemicidal violence in the former colonies? And that was mm. I could have I couldn't have thought about that, although it is so obvious. So. Thank you very much for that. Um, that's a point we would like to focus more afterwards. Um, and I don't want to ask you any individual questions because um, there are none in the chat. And for me, everything was so clear, so crystal clear that I don't have um, like, I mean, many questions, but nothing like, could you explain me more because I didn't understand it. Um, but um, as a moderator, I would, because before we had um, said that we wanted to make a short break in between, and um, I would like to um, the panelists to um, turn on their videos and uh, make a suggestion. If you need the break, because before we had said we want a break, now we are running a bit out of time, and maybe we had also the um, um, possibility to relax a bit. Could you please not if you need a break or wave your head if you don't need it? No? Okay, thanks. So in that case, um, I would invite us to the, the round table format and um, we can Thanks to Svenja Schurade, who did all the amazing organization work in this conference. We can stay in this room until at, at last 12.45. So at 12 o'clock, I would um, say goodbye to everyone who um, does not want to sacrifice uh, her or they um, uh, lunch break. But um, I think as long as we want to follow with the discussion, we can stay here then until 12.45. Okay, um, so I've got two questions to, to all of you. And then I would like to invite um, Jan and, and um, Stella to uh, collect the questions of the chat and hand them over to us. Um, and the question that was um, most um, what was that was just most palpable was um, that the intersectional or the yeah the obligation to have an intersectional view um, in in the transnational feminist struggle if it wants to be an anti patriarchal struggle um, has been. Um, marked by every one of you, and I in Sohila in your proposal to um, tell us what are you doing to stop femicide in Namibia, for instance. Um, what are you? What are your narratives about these the two genocides that Germany committed, the genocide against the Herero and Nama also? Um, how could we, from that intersectional lens? combine different or supposedly different struggles because um, one struggle seems to be in the narrative, the hegemonical, seems to be the feminist struggle and the other, the anti-racist struggle. But I think that they can and they must in some, some parts be linked. Um, and in your proposal, I see that really clearly I could also imagine that in a practice, in a concrete practice, that could mean not only to map transvesticide, transfemicide, femicide, but also um, racist killings, and and think about how they are connected, for instance. So I would like to ask you if you have such concrete proposals, what an intersectional um, perspective could mean for a practice for all of us, for um, scholars here in Germany, uh, 
in in post-colonial states so it's like in what are the concrete proposals are there any or what are theoretical proposals um yeah who so you want to like go first you yeah, maybe just a uh, just to, to start us or it, it's a tricky question obviously i don't know too much about the german context on the ground but i think i mean the point of intersectionality is to say that some people some women don't just experience violence or discrimination because they are women but because they are black women or immigrant women or queer women um and so i think yeah necessarily we we've discussed a little bit the idea of mapping violence so that it wouldn't just include people because often when we talk about femicide we talk about you know sort of like a hate crime against women a woman being killed because she's a woman or a trans person being killed because they are trans um whereas we must then look also at women who are killed because they are black women or because they are immigrant women or because they are women living in a colony um but but how then to take that beyond I suppose an awareness into actual action is where I guess it comes a little more complicated. And I think that the danger is to be like, perhaps you are responsible for some of the women dying in in Namibia, but Namibia does not necessarily want you to impose aid onto them in order to to alleviate that responsibility. And I think that's where this idea of solidarity, not guilt comes into being. And so I think that the first step is to say, who are the activists on the ground in Namibia? And there are many of them and they are often young people and students like, like many of you. Um, and then to, to ask, how do we form solidarity? What does that look like to you? What do you need from us? Because it might be it might be related to funding, or it might be related to plat to a platform. Um, and I am not a Namibian, and I can't give give all of those answers. But I think forming those connections, which is what today is supposed to be about as well, is is the only starting step you can take. Pretty clear. Thanks. Tiago and Aleida, do you want to add anything? Yes, I, I can add something. Um, I think that it's at least from, from the people that uh, elaborated or have elaborated the concept of uh, feminicide, we all are aware that we cannot work on feminicide without an intersectional lens, because as uh, Shahela just mentioned, we are never just uh, a woman, we are not never just a uh, working class, so we are many things at the same time. So when I talk also about complexity, it's in terms of that. So for instance, in practical things, what will that mean in, in feminicide? For instance, when you are fighting against it, you just don't focus on one type of femicide, for instance, but you want to cover many types of feminicides. And also, like when you talk about these types, you also um, emphasize like 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 the like the connections. Like let's say, well, uh, partner uh, intimate feminicide. Yes, but how, for instance, migrant women. Uh, experience that in the German context or um, when we talk about the situation in the Americas or in Africa or in India because that's um, people focus on them it's like yes it's not only but what is like the, the role of Europe or US and China in these territories that Ash Shofela has mentioned in a way uh, enables also these kind of violences. So I think there are many examples of how intersectionality and particularly decolonial feminism, uh, um, communitarian feminism, at least in the Americas, they, they are very, they embodied, they are embedded in this intersectionality. So I think there is, um, yeah, that there, are, there are ways to, to work on that by being aware of that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Do you want to add on that, Thiago? 
I completely agree with Sohila and Aleida. I think the intersectionality is the way to recognize the how the violence intensifies or and diversifies mm -hmm. with with in many cultures with with many populations when <laughs> I don't know uh, I, I agree with Aleida and Sahila. I just wanted to clarify on that, that violence can diversify and intensify in some cultures. In Argentina, for example, uh, intensifies it intensifies a lot with migrant people. We have a lot of cases of trans femicides and feminicides who, when the violence is, uh, I don't know the term for recrudecer. It's so much terrible and fa fatal when the people, the transgender woman or the woman or the transgender man is a migrant person from certain countries. Uh, that's a concrete case uh, when inter intersectionality uh, reveals uh, as, as we recognize it. Thanks, yeah, and can turn into other forms of lynching mobs against that racialization. And it's, thank you for that um, complex answers. And I think it also answers like the, these immersed, immersed um, question that's kind of, clinging on over our heads like can feminism be global can we have a collective identity and i think no we can't and maybe the the dream of a global sisterhood i mean trans people would say okay anyway it's a sisterhood hood with a with a c um that this dream is not the dream of everyone of every trans feminist um intersectional feminist um persons in their groups um beca because those histories of complicity of other feminist uh, views cannot be erased. So just get rid of that dream and get down to the ground and think about what kind of platforms can there be instead of uh, dreaming us to be all equal, um, but to recognize us as, as equals, knowing that in the given conditions we aren't. So we are made separate. Um, I... Julie, if I could, if I could add something really quickly here, yeah. it was just something that occurred to me while listening to Aleda and Tiago speak, uh, and speak especially about like the position occupied by migrant women um, or migrant trans people. And here, I think is something really concrete, uh, which is to say. An intersectional approach isn't just to say we understand that they experience femicide or trans femicide differently and that violence is often more intense, but also to say how then must the policies we push for to protect these women and these trans people, how must they look different? So, for example, Oh, no, I think, did we lose her? So Hila, can you sit here us? Um, okay, I hope that she will um, come back and maybe we could meanwhile, because um, as I said, we promised to um, draw the um, the author ethnographical map in the background and Jana did that um, and she we could um, yeah w while waiting for for Suhila um, just give the floor to Jana and give you all before the panel ends officially also the um, possibility of have a look on that um, Jana are you there and are you prepared? And would you like also to comment on your map then? 
Okay, um, yes, one moment. <laughs> um, I'm just opening the file. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, yeah, this was very much input and very fast, and I really I can show you what happens here. <laughs> Can you see it? Yes, we can. <laughs> wow, okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, should I say something or is it just the impression? I mean, yeah, it's not complete or something and it's uh, more grabbing some points I felt really touched by or something. <laughs> yeah. um, and also the big, maybe the big questions like, how do we call a feminicide or um, can we de decolonize feminism from a colonist perspective? I found really, really interesting. And also the, yeah, the a bit the how to's uh, be decolonial intersectional. Um, active listening the how to from global north from Aleda. i hope i i yeah maybe i don't say so much to it. thank you and the sos calls that tiago uh, told us about 26 out of forty thousand being trans people or trans women um if you i mean we can also give one last minute to everyone to have a look on it to kind of travel through this map which is really impressive and um then also say goodbye to everyone who want to leave us on the official time and um give us two minutes of a break come back and hope um that suhila will be there and meanwhile uh, we have the the um, possibility to have a look on the map and be a bit on ourselves. Okay, then I would like to invite you to come back. Um, thank you so much, Jana. It's so impressive, and I lost. I was. I got lost a bit traveling through it. Um, and I think we can also provide it to everyone uh, who participated and listened to the panel. If you send us um, your email, maybe via the chat. Um, and I would like Tiago and Alida and Sohila, it's so good to have you back. Um, if there is something you want to add to this map, um, some association, some impulse, uh, you're invited to do that. And then afterwards, I would, uh, yeah, invite Suhila to continue with her idea uh, she was expressing while then being thrown out. Yeah. I would like to, yes, but can I speak in Spanish? Um, I think so. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, thank you. Con respecto, me parece importante agregar algo que Sohila mencionó en su intervención sobre la situación de las cárceles. Sorry, I don't, I don't hear a translation. Okay. Um, um, I was muted. I uh, was muted. Anna was muted, so, okay. Uh, could you add um, again, please? Thank you. Sorry. So don't worry. I wanted to mention, because it, it, it was important for me to put something into the map about the prisons, so something that Soela mentioned in her input, it refers to, um, to I don't know this term, in the, in the prisons here in Argentina, especially down to the gender difference, it's a bit slower maybe. Uh, so the amount of people with migrant backgrounds is very, very high. So, um, so people being together in the prison, for example, women in the 
in, in the crisis, the trends So there's trans uh, women who are constantly violated and assassinated for and, and so there's an organization Argentina that two, two years ago um, close to Argentina to, to Buenos Aires that it's just um, becoming such a, a bigger thing when people have a migrant background. So on Bolivia and Paraguay, you really have to point that out, um, the situation with the feminicides in the prisons, especially here in Argentina, it happens just so much, it's so, such high numbers. So the feminicides aren't directly uh, directly um, um, done. It's more like passively that they leave them starved to death, or the, some some other way they they kill them. spreading this idea of femicide um, towards other, other forms of killings by the state, state institutions. Um, any more ideas regarding the map? Regarding the map, okay. <laughs> if there are none, no problem. I mean, we have enough to discuss. Um, and also we were asked if we can share it um, afterwards in the panel. Um, and for sure, Jana already said that if you want to have a look at, at it afterwards, um, you're very welcome. So I, mean, I want to address two points, but it's not related to the map, but oh. to what they have said. So I don't know when <laughs> I'm not a strict moderator, so um, um, maybe if you can keep it short, perfect, because um, that there is still space for the listeners' questions. And I, I, I rather prefer to go to the listeners, and then if there is time, we discuss. <clears throat> I address the other questions. Yeah. Okay. 